Good evening. Welcome to Lycoming Valley Baptist Church. Uh, listen, let me give you a little bit of announcement so that we get it. Uh, Sunday morning, we are planning on having our service here on the grounds outside, 930, weather permitting. We're asking everyone to bring your own chairs, and also there's no children's program, uh, and we'd like only to use the building for emergency bathroom reasons. So I know it may be inconvenient to some people, but we need to get started. So we're going to try to get it started on Sunday. And um, please uh, uh, give us your uh, kindest benefits of the doubt as we do something we've never done before. So we're going to start there. And I hope that you'll be able to join us. And those who are not able to join, we are still going to have our visual, virtual video uh, sermon on Sunday morning. So for those people, nothing changes. So I, I pray that you'll be gracious as we seek to be gracious too and, and try to get this thing underway and we can get back to meeting together. Now let's pray. Father, I thank you for this night. I pray, God, you'll bless the time that we share together too. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me discuss one of the most gruesome things I can think about discussing, and that's this. I want you to turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to 2 Samuel 13 while I bring this up. One out of nine girls under the age of 18 will be raped or sexually assaulted. One out of 52 boys under the age of 18 will be raped or sexually assaulted. And someone will quickly think or say, Pastor, come on, that's not something that we should be discussing at church because that only happens uh, to bad people, children of bad people. And we're good people. We go to church. I might, I might buy into that, probably not, but I might buy into that if I didn't read my Bible uh, the way I read it. And I'd like you to turn to first, Second Samuel, excuse me, verse chapter 13 and verse 14. And this is what it says. But he refused to listen to her, and since he was stronger than she, he raped her. We are talking about Tamar, who is the daughter of David. We are talking about Amnon, who is the son of David and the half-brother of Tamar. And then we're talking about David, of whom the Bible says so wonderfully, he was a man after God's own heart. So my thinking is this, if this is true, then it's going to happen even in good families, church-going families. It'll happen to children of godly people. And you know what? We need to know what to do about it. I've been in ministry over 40 years, and I've had more than a couple of these come to me. I, it's just, it's devastating when it happens. And it seems like no matter what you do, it never can be fully handled correctly. But I will put my record up against anyone because I, I've always done the same thing, and that is taken the bull by the horn and made it as public as fast as I could in dealing, and as far as the need to be, in dealing with these situations and circumstances over the past 40 plus years. But if you're ever going to find uh, a passage of scripture on the wrong way to handle sexual abuse or rape among believers, you're going to find it in the Second Samuel portion of Scripture, 13, all the way out to 18. Now, I have not the time to go into this in great detail tonight, tonight, 
But what I want to do is deal with it briefly. And I want to deal with it by telling us, okay, let me say something. This is the wrong way to handle. First of all, Amnon rapes Tamar. And after he rapes Tamar, because he's stronger than her, and that's the reason given, he's stronger than her, Amnon, which is not surprising, does not do the right thing by Tamar. Biblically, having deflowered her, stolen her virginity, raped her, what he should have done is he should have married her. But he refused to do that. And the scripture tells us in verse 15 of chapter 13 that he hated her with such an intense hatred. He hated her more than he had once loved her. And he told her, get up and get out. She said, no, that's wrong. What you should do, and she gave him the biblical thought, you should marry me. And he said to his servant, get her out of here. Throw her out. Lock the door behind her. Get rid of her. And as far as we know, Amnon never had another thing to do with her after he raped her for as long as he lived. Now, Amnon had a brother, and his brother's name was Absalom. And Absalom was pretty insightful. He discovered that um, something had happened between Tamar and Amnon, and he asked uh, Tamar, did, did that happen? Did he rape you? And she said, yes. And then he gave her, listen to this, the worst advice I have ever heard, the worst counsel I have ever heard in my life. And it's in 2 Samuel chapter 13, same chapter. And in verse 20, he says, listen to this, don't take this to heart. Don't, don't let it affect you. She just got raped. And then she's been abandoned. And he says, in the, with the best of intentions, don't take this to heart. It gets worse instead of better because his father, David, the man after God's own heart, finds out what happened. He heard everything that took place. And the scripture says in verse 21, same chapter, that when David, King David heard all of this, he was furious. He was incensed. He was on fire. He was burned up inside with anger. But he never said a word. He never said a word. Absalom, same verse got angrier and angrier and angrier with Amnon, but he never said a word. The next verse, 22, 23 rather, says this, two years passed. Now stop. The only thing that Tamar had was Absalom's foolish counsel to don't take it to heart. And for two years, nobody says anything. Nobody does anything about it. And her father who knows everything, said nothing. Is it any wonder that the Bible describes Tamar in verse uh, 20 and then again in, uh, in, in 22 as being devastated, as being desolate, and as being disgraced? Somehow, some way, it seems to me that in the way some churches and Christians deal with sexual abuse, they somehow lose the victim. They forget the victim. They cover their tracks. They try to make the perpetrator either come out looking fairly good or, or simply just try to get rid of them, get them out of sight, but they forget the victim. They forget the victim. And that's what happens here. Well, two years later, Absalom's anger and 
hatred of Amnon because of what he did to his sister boils come to a boil and he decides to kill him and we read in chapter 13 um, and verse 28 Absalom tells his boys when Abnon gets drunk strike him down and kill him don't be afraid I ordered it just kill him and they do and after they kill Amnon Absalom flees so you got the rapist murdered killed by his brother you've got the victim ignored and you've got Absalom who kills the rapist running like crazy and he goes to a place called Geshur where he stayed according to verse 38 for three years after three years the same verse says king david longed to go to absalom for he was consoled concerning amnon's death after the death after absalom runs somehow david comes to terms with Abs what absalom did I assume it's because Absalom killed a rapist, even if it was his own son. But in any case, he has a desire to see him. But once again, David does nothing about it. He does nothing about it. He has a general, General Joab, who seems to have a lot of insight into David's thinking. And so Joab comes up and hatches a plan. It's a pretty good plan uh, as far as getting him back together again. And his plan is to have uh, David allow Absalom to come back. And sure enough, convoluted, you have to read it there in verse 14, uh, chapter 14, and verses 1 through 22. But in verse 23, then Joab went to Geshur and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. But let me tell you something. It just gets worse and worse. David calls him back, but David refuses to talk to him. He says he can come back, but I will not talk to him. Silence. Nobody addresses anything. No one ever says, hey, here's the problem. Let's deal with it. Here's the biblical way to deal with it. No, it's just ignored. Maybe if we ignore it, it'll go away. It never happens. It only gets worse. And sure enough, it gets worse. Absalom gets sick and tired of David ignoring him. They're now they're living very close to each other. And he asked the question, why did I ever come back from Geshur? Why? Why did I even bother? And ultimately, he goes into a uh, re revolt against his father. What's he got to lose? And he revolts against his father. Now, all of this begins with the rape of his sister by his brother, stepbrother. And it all is made worse because nobody will talk about it most particularly david david will say nothing to the victim he says nothing to the rapist and he says nothing to his son absalom who he knows knows everything and when he comes back he says nothing to him again we're talking five years of silence and then add another two. We're talking seven years of silence and then Absalom gets into a revolt and he revolts against the king. And as he revolts against the king, all sorts of things happen. It's really worthy of reading and it goes all the way through to chapter 18 where ultimately um, Absalom is killed. And uh, 
and, and David discovers that Absalom is killed. And you go to the last verse of chapter 18, and you have these words. They're famous words. David finds out that Absalom is dead. Now understand something. He's, he's lost his daughter, per se, because she's been victimized. He's lost Amnon because he's been killed. And now he's lost Absalom because he too is dead. And finally, David says something. Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Could you imagine if when David discovered that Amnon had murdered, excuse me, raped Tamar, David had gone to Tamar and said, Tamar, oh, Tamar, oh, Tamar, my daughter. If only I had been raped in place of you. But he says nothing. If he had just gone to Amnon and said, you know, this is what you did, and this is what we have to do about it. But he did. And if he had ever gone to Absalom during any one of those seven years and said, oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom, we need to reconcile. We need to deal with these issues. We need to put our family back together. What a difference it would have made. But the reality is everything has been made worse simply because nobody would address the issues. Nobody would address the sin. Let me just say this. We don't have an issue that I know of in our church. I do not know that. I, don't, I, mean, I have no idea that there is one, I, I honestly. But if there's something going on, and if you need to deal with it, I'm telling you, letting it go and ignoring it is absolutely the worst thing. Whatever the sin is, with the, ignoring it and letting it go is absolutely the worst thing you can possibly do. It's the most unbiblical thing. If you ever want to find out why, it's right here in this text. Thank you, Lord, for letting us look at this terrible topic I pray, God, it will be used in our lives to glorify you in a strange and a different way. In Jesus' name, amen.